that contrary to appearances and in the face of the inherent psychological pressure of detention and interrogation, the state still considers the suspect possibly innocent, acknowledges that it could be mistaken in its suspicions, and allows that the suspect is free to act as much as possible like an innocent person in the sense of ignoring strangers' intrusive personal questions. It should be noted that the consensus among American law enforcement is that the Miranda warning has had little effect on confession rates since it was introduced in the U.S. in, in 1966. Affording suspects due process protections and admonishing them of their rights, even when they've been caught red-handed or publicly admitted to their crimes, should not be viewed as a weakening of the state in the long term, but as a self-assigned test of the effectiveness and professionalism of the state's law enforcement institutions. Law enforcement and security forces in developing nations whose approach to crime detection or counterterrorism is to torture confessions out of mostly innocent people before tossing them into holes wrong their citizens twice. First in the way just mentioned and second by being incompetent in solving genuine crimes. Now let's move on to POW rights. According to post-Westphalian just war theory, service personnel at war are permitted unique privileges to kill combatants in equal measure with their enemies because they are serving their state, a generically good thing, rather than acting from personal animus. Conventional combatants in an interstate war do have a right to their tactical secrets because and when they regard morally upright activities. This is to say POWs no more wrong enemy interrogators with silence or lies than they wrong the enemy by attacking him in the field. Just the same, since their enemies are permitted to counter their battlefield maneuvers using means like camouflage and trickery, interrogators can adopt deceptive deceptive tactics in interrogation to counter their detainees' <laughs> silence or evasions. Physical of violence against the POW is disproportionate and impermissible, since the shackled POW is not a physical threat to anyone. Since he has a right to his tactical secrets, he may not be threatened with impermissible violence nor threatened with revocation of POW privileges. Nothing about his detention may be punitive. The POW has no need of a lawyer since he is immune from prosecution for ordinary combat activities. Irregular combatants acting at the behest of a state, remnant state, or nascent state may have moral claim to belligerent privileges and POW treatment in detention instead of criminal prosecution. This when they are the armed wing of a political entity directing violence against their enemy's military apparatus for a just purpose and treat inhabitants of territory under their control in a generally rights-respecting manner. Absent these qualifiers, they lose the corporate privileges of those wielding political violence, and they can be viewed on individual bases for culpability in criminal behavior. <coughs> Unprivileged irregulars, like Al-Qaeda members, lack a right to their tactical secrets since the secrets concern criminal actions. Yet a non-uniformed, unprivileged irregular is often superficially indistinguishable to the detaining power from an innocent civilian. An Afghan, Iraqi, or Pakistani captured in the vicinity of a weapon, holding a weapon, or even using a weapon, isn't necessarily an irregular fighter any more than, say, a Texan doing the same is an irregular fighter. Well, what if he's caught in red-handed attacking government forces? There's more <coughs> prima facie evidence here, but how many Texans wouldn't shoot masked intruders on their property late at night? Far from being freed from the necessity of acting in a morally scrupulous way overseas, the detaining power should be even more scrupulous in meeting at least the spirit of due process when detaining foreign nationals abroad. State agents can justify their rights infringing behavior toward domestic criminal suspects with the rationale that a relatively crime-free environment is in every inhabitant's interest. But, for example, a CIA team isn't acting to suppress local crime in Italy when seizing a suspected Al-Qaeda recruiter off the street in Milan. State agents may take proportionate steps to defend their country 
which perhaps includes kidnapping terror suspects in countries with unreliable law enforcement partners, but a wrongly suspected person is purely wronged if detained by foreign agents, even if those agents don't act wrongly in detaining him. These natural rights violations are compounded if the suspect is tortured, held without charge, or denied a mean of challenging his detention. So now having discussed two modes of state behavior proper to two classes of individuals, one wonders if unprivileged irregulars are so dissimilar from ordinary criminals or privileged belligerents that a third approach in interrogation, detention, and trial is warranted for them. Unprivileged irregulars are usually acting for political ends, like privileged belligerents, but they lack rights to commit their violent acts, like ordinary criminals. Also like criminals, they usually do not self-identify, and so state agents need to develop techniques to identify them without treating suspects the same way as guilty people. The question to bear in mind as we proceed, in addition to the rights and liabilities of suspected irregulars, is this. Is there anything the detaining power wants to do with captured suspected irregulars that it can't do with law enforcement or POW approaches? We can exclude torture from possible desiderata since it's an unreliable interrogation tool as well as a moral catastrophe and a cancer on any government. The non-coercive interrogation tactics used in law enforcement and POW style interrogations are nearly the same and they're generally effective. The only possible efficacious tactics I think excluded from both approaches are threats and blackmail and both should probably be excluded for practical reasons. So now having excluded a third type of interrogation and detention just for unprivileged irregulars, the criterion appropriate for the detaining power to use, I think, in deciding whether law enforcement or POW style approaches is appropriate is as follows. Is the paramount concern gathering intelligence from a detainee or indictable evidence against a detainee? In the former case, POW style interrogation offers more flexibility in that there is no time limit on interrogation and no lawyer to perhaps precipitously end interrogation. However, these departures from due process also arguably create a more coercive environment where subsequent confessions can ju be judged as less reliable. Civilian criminal trials can proceed if the government is confident it has indictable evidence independent of detainees' interrogation. Battlefield or extraterritorial seizures of irregulars will not necessarily prejudice prosecution in the U.S because of the so-called Kerr-Frisbee doctrine, which says that it's okay if we kidnap people as once they're brought into the criminal justice arena. We should note that operations in foreign theaters like Afghanistan or Iraq with, shall we say, less sensitive legal cultures mm -hmm. see routine, low-level, unprivileged irregulars turned over to indigenous law enforcement after U.S. military interrogators had finished interrogating them. With a civilian trial, the government can secure one of its two presumed desiderata, long-term incarceration or capital punishment. The government, its citizens, and the wider world can also enjoy more confidence that actual guilty parties were brought to justice. Unprivileged irregulars are denied whatever rhetorical prestige or dignity is associated with the lawful belligerent status. Hewing to our own values, even to prosecute those who reject them, also testifies to the strength of these values to the whole world. The detaining power should not use in a civilian trial the less reliable confession produced in a POW style interrogation if it lacks other indictable evidence. This leaves two options. One, holding a military commission with weaker due process protections which permit the use of confessions procured by military interrogators provided, quote, that the totality of circumstances renders the statement reliable and voluntary, end quote. A full array of punishments are possible here, 
though convictions and particularly executions likely will carry less legitimacy given the unorthodox nature of the trials. On this point, I should also add that seeking bin Laden's lifetime incarceration is probably preferable to executing him because of his presumed power posthumously as a martyr. Another option is to designate unprivileged irregulars as POWs and hold them, as Geneva permits, until the end of hostilities, which in the case of militant Islam may be a very long time. POW designation would be in spite of the irregulars' failure to qualify for that status. While somewhat disconcerting, this is not without precedent in the U.S., since the U.S. afforded Viet Cong prisoners the status of POWs. According to President Obama's March 7, 2011 executive order, 48 <coughs> Guantanamo detainees whose treatment and interrogation makes both civilian trial and military commissions impossible are now going to be held indefinitely without trial in Guantanamo under color of military law. This maneuver would seem to amount to POW designation in everything but name and perhaps is done in this ad hoc manner to avoid the rhetorical legitimization of Al-Qaeda detainees as privileged belligerents. The benefits of instead formally designating detainees as POWs would be to hew to an established legal framework with international legitimacy. Neither route, in the absence of a trial, permits capital sentencing. The POW route would permit detainees the privilege of writing their families, which seems reasonable to me. And assuming they do not behave badly, the privilege of housing in secured barrack-style accommodations instead of supermax-style solitary confinement. There is less impetus for a POW-style interrogation if a bin Laden or other suspected Al-Qaeda member is not presumed to have time-sensitive intelligence. If indictable evidence already exists against the detainee, then a law enforcement-style interrogation offers a prospect of more reliable information, more international legitimacy, and a more secure route to a civilian trial. We should note that bin Laden was indicted in absentia in a Texas court in 1998. If confession is needed for indictment, then the due process protections associated with a law enforcement style interrogation are necessary to secure usable evidence for a criminal trial. So, in summary, <clears throat> a POW style interrogation followed by military commission or designation of a, as a POW is indicated if bin Laden is believed to be a source of actionable intelligence regarding ongoing or imminent operations. If authorities judge bin Laden to be a figurehead disconnected from ongoing operations, and so their chief interest is prosecution for past crimes, then they must pursue a law enforcement approach with him, including the Miranda warning. Thank you. <clears throat> You have two more minutes. <laughs> I was efficient. Thank you. All right. And then uh, finally, last, uh, Dr. David Wetham. Uh, he earned his PhD from in war studies at King's College London and is currently senior lecturer there in the defense studies department based at the Joint Services Command and Staff College at the UK Defense Academy. And he can in person explain that to you. Maybe take too long to go into. In that capacity, he coordinates or delivers the military ethics component of courses uh, for between two and 3,000 officers a year. He is also a visiting lecturer in military ethics at the Baltic Defense College and the Kuwaiti Staff College and was a Stockdale Center fellow this past January. David's most recent publication, Ethics Law and Military Operations, is written for practitioners at the operational level of war. And finally, in, in his spare time, David plays trombone with the Corsham Band, uh, is a magistrate on the Swindon, Swindon bench, and fences with the uh, medieval longsword and epée. Epée. So I turn the panel over to a, an informative, entertaining, and potentially dangerous man. <laughs> thank you very much, Ed. Um, <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to be able to come back here um, and also for setting me the task of uh, 
surveying such a challenging topic in, in 20 minutes. I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, I had to take a, a Tea Party budget approach to what I was originally going to deliver, and um, it's, it's been severely cut.